Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be doing a Q&A. We're here in Florida. So we need a special Florida coffee. I also want to invite you guys to grab a drink, grab a snack, because this is going to be a long chatty q and I know you guys love those and I love making them for you, so I'm so excited. We're also going to try something new today. I saw this at Whole Foods of all places. I've never tried Chamberlain coffee before and it's a cinnamon bun latte, so I figured Let's try this for the q and I'm gonna add some ice. Okay, let's see if it's any good. It's pretty good. It's better than Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> So it is time for our monthly q and A. I I really love filming these videos for you guys. I try and make them as long and as chatty as possible. And as always, I'm just gonna be super, super honest and unfiltered in my answers because I just love having these honest, heart-to-heart, -heart, friend friend-to-friend chats with you guys. My hope is that it feels like we're on FaceTime, like just grabbing a coffee together, two friends hanging out. I got so many questions this Q&A because I posted on both YouTube and Instagram. I think this is the most questions for a Q&A I've ever gotten. So we're gonna go through as many as we can. I'll either do a part two or I'll answer some more on Instagram. So make sure you're following me on Instagram if you have that app. If you use Instagram, I will put my at on the screen. I'll also link it down below. And if this is the first video of mine that you are watching, my name is Zoe. Normally. I live in Montreal, but I'm here on vacation in Florida right now, staying at my mother-in-law's place. She's a snowbird, so she spends her winters in Florida and her the rest of the year in Quebec. And they have two cats that you might hear running around, their little collars jingling. They're so cute. I actually have a story time for you about the cats that I will insert at the end of the video. So anyways, all that to say, I'm so happy to be here hanging out with you guys. Now, before we get into the questions, I want to thank True Earth for sponsoring this video. I have been using them for years now and I have never looked back. And I love them so much that I had to bring them here with me to Florida to do my laundry. We're here in Florida. We came here at Carry On Only. So of course we have some laundry to do. Not to mention, I just need to do laundry every few days. It satisfies me. I'm so excited to be working with True Earth on this video. It was so easy to bring these down here. They're so thin and we could do laundry every day for like three months with all of this. But anyways, we're gonna do some today. And the cool part about Florida is that the laundry is outside. So let's go. I'm in my Martha Stewart era. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we're doing darks. Step one is just to throw everything, all of your clothes in the washing machine. So we have a few options. We have fragrance free, fresh linen, and lilac breeze. We're gonna use this one today because it's my personal favorite. And this is so easy. There's no measuring, there's no sticky liquids, nothing like that. You take out one sheet. This is for two loads. So you break it in half. And this one sheet is all you need to do a load of laundry. I like to rip it up smaller and then you just toss it in with your laundry. I actually am not 100% sure how to use these machines. Washer. So we'll turn it on. But I like a cool temperature. And that's it. Takes up no space in your laundry room compared to like a big, ugly, heavy jug. If you ever have a really small load, you can use half a sheet, or if you have a really big load, you can do one and a half. And that's it. Cut. We're good. To me, switching over to True Earth is simply a no-brainer. It's easy, it cleans your clothes just as well as traditional laundry detergent. Because look at this, you guys. This is three months worth of laundry detergent, as opposed to like those big, plastic jugs filled with water that they have to ship around. It takes up so much less room in the space where you do your laundry or if you bring your laundry to a laundromat, so much easier just to carry one of these around. I simply love them. I love the fact that they are Canadian and they have been an amazing partner on my channel over the years. So I'm so excited to be working with them once again. If you guys wanna check them out, I will have True Earth linked down below as well as a discount code so you can save some money on your purchase. Thank you so much to True Earth for sponsoring this video. All right, you guys, let's dive into the questions. I'm gonna start with the ones I got on YouTube since I feel like YouTube, you guys are like my OGs. 
start with an easy one this is from jose he says what is your nationality so i am half lebanese and half british both of my parents were born in canada but my dad's side is lebanese my grandmother immigrated from lebanon to canada when she was i believe 18 years old and my paternal grandfather was either born in canada or moved here when he was very very young my mom's parents who i actually never met they both passed away before i was born they both immigrated here together from Great Britain. So yeah, they had like British accents and everything, but my mom does not. She was born in Canada. Funny enough, both of my parents were born in Southwestern Ontario, actually near the US border near Detroit, but they only met in Ottawa, which is where I was born. So half British, half Lebanese. We got a lot of questions about money. So let's dive in to one right away. This one is from Carolyn. She says, how to save money when you feel like doing so would sacrifice on your wants. I totally get that and that was really my perspective about saving in the beginning was like no like i want this i want that i want whatever it may be material things trips uh food like restaurants i felt like all of that was more important than saving and i think a lot of people have this mentality that when you're young you should just enjoy and worry about saving later personally i think it's all about balance i don't think you should sacrifice every single one of your wants but i also kind of think like at the end of the day you can want everything, but you don't need to have everything. So for me on my like own personal finance journey, the best thing that I learned was to really figure out what I want and cut everything else out. I feel like I say this all the time, but personally, I prefer spending money on clothes, jewelry, little accessories than an expensive night out at the restaurant. But you could be the complete opposite. You might prefer a night out at the restaurant with your friends and having like more of a capsule wardrobe. It just takes some self-reflection to figure out what you truly, truly want and what you value the most. And from there, you can start cutting everything else out and putting that money into savings. The other side of that is that you need to look at saving not as a punishment, but as something that you want. You need to want to save money. I want to save money now and I get really excited at saving my money and putting it into my investments because I know that it is a gift to myself in the future. What I gift to myself now by putting it into an investment is going to grow for me over time and allow me to live a safe and comfortable life well into the future and into my old age. I also think once you start saving money, it really does become addictive. Seeing the amounts in your bank account and in your investment accounts grow is so satisfying that you're gonna say to yourself, okay, no, I wanna pass up on this new purse or this trip with maybe some people who are like, maybe you get invited to a trip with like some drama people and you're like, okay, I could spend a thousand dollars on this trip with these drama people or I could put that thousand dollars to my emergency fund and sleep better at night. These are just the kind of decisions that you'll have to make and you'll actually learn to become excited <laughs> by putting the money in your emergency fund. But baby steps, I think baby steps is it. It can feel really overwhelming and you feel like you need to start cutting everything out and saving everything right away. That's not the case. Start small, start slow you'll build up that momentum the same way that we can build up momentum when we're shopping or spending money in general, and you'll get that feeling with your savings. So try it out. Good luck. I know you could do it. Oh, also, I'm going to do a shameless plug. I just posted a video about did budgeting make me boring? And we talked a lot about that topic. So I'll link it up here. Another money question here from Jackin. They asked if money was no object, what would you be doing? I definitely think I'd be doing YouTube because I was doing YouTube when like I had other jobs and YouTube wasn't paying me. It's just so much fun. I also think I would love to be just in something like fun and creative. I was joking around, I always joke about this, whenever a new season of Love is Blind or The Ultimatum comes out, you guys know the music, if you watch those shows, you know the music that they put in the background is so funny. I definitely think it's tailor-made for the show because there'll be a scene where like they're having coffee and like let's say they get into a fight and then the song will be like, the coffee's gone cold, my love for you is changing, you know, something like that. And like, I want that job. Like I wanna watch Love is Blind and like make up the songs. It doesn't have to be my voice singing. I know I don't have a good singing voice, but like, let me write the songs. That is like a dream job for me. Another dream job that like I used to, I went to university, my original university major was marketing because I wanted to write commercial jingles. So something creative writing, something kind of funny, I feel like that would really satisfy me. I mean, it's not to say that like I couldn't do that now. I just have no idea how I would get into it. I need to like send Netflix a recording of me like singing along to Love is Blind or something. I would also really, really love, and this is something that I'm just gonna put it out there because I would love to do it one day, is writing. I would love to do some form of creative writing, writing. Honestly, I would love to write children's books. I think that would be so fun. 
something I don't talk about a lot on YouTube because it just never really comes up is this really like weirdo creative um like kind of funny silly side of me that i feel like i could really channel that energy like into a children's book or like i would have fun like writing like broadway musicals like just dumb stuff i don't know lately that's i've been in a really happy mood lately like both at home and of course here on vacation and when i'm really really happy that really silly side comes out of me so that probably is influencing this answer but it always has been a dream of mine to maybe go back to school or to do some kind of like creative writing course, maybe like a retreat or something. I'd love to write a book one day, just putting that out there. From Tanya, she said, what is the biggest thing you've learned about yourself over the last year? So I did see this question in advance and I kind of thought about my answer a little bit. I'm really happy with what I landed on. I think over the past year, the biggest and the coolest and the most important thing I learned is that I do not have to be defined by my previous mental health states. And what I mean by that is I used to really identify as an anxious person, a person who was prone to depression. And I kind of had this idea in my head that for my whole life, I would be anxious and that I would go in and out of depression and that I would always feel this way. I kind of had this idea that it was just in my blood and in my brain chemistry and I mean, to a certain extent, I do believe that's true. My mom struggles a lot with her mental health and I think I'm not blaming this on her by any means, but she would always tell me like, it's just how you're wired, it's how you're wired, it's how you're wired. But what I've learned over the past year is that by really taking care of myself and by listening to myself and listening to my body, I don't have to be that anxious person all of the time, any of the time, most of the time, like I can control to a certain extent and more than I ever thought I could, I can control the way that I feel and the way that I live my life. For example, I went through, like since I was a child, I've dealt with anxiety. And yeah, I do think I have maybe like a generalized anxiety disorder or I have anxiety, okay? I know I do, but I don't have to let that define me and that means that I don't have to feel anxious every day. The craziest thing that I learned is, and I think back to when I was working in consulting, okay? When I was working at the big four, I would drink one to two, maybe three coffees per day. And some of these would be like a double shot latte, okay? So a lot of caffeine. Caffeine for people with anxiety can really, really get the heart rate up and give you a physical feeling of anxiety without it necessarily being mental. Like I would have these feelings of like, oh my God, my heart's racing, I'm so anxious, but like what's making me anxious, da 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 da. I went through a lot of my job at the big four feeling that constant anxiety, but looking back, I was drinking so much caffeine. As an anxious person, no one told me to stop drinking coffee. No one told me to stop having caffeine. I kind of came to that conclusion on my own because I would take breaks from it and realize that I felt a lot better, especially under stressful circumstances. So like going to work and you don't like your job, drinking caffeine was only making me that much more anxious. So when I cut out or mostly cut out caffeine, like I know I'm drinking a coffee right now, I'm probably talking really fast, but I'm on vacation and I know that this is an environment where I can handle the caffeine. I can go outside, I can burn off the energy if I need to, but limiting, dramatically limiting the amount of caffeine that I had has made me a severely less anxious person. So it's taught me that I can have control over these feelings. I don't have to throw my hands up and surrender and be this anxious person for the rest of my life because I don't wanna be that person. I wanna be happy, I wanna be vibrant, I wanna be calm, I wanna be at peace. I don't wanna be anxious every day. I know that I might get anxious more often than like a neurotypical person and that's okay, but I don't have to like admit defeat and just be like, I'm gonna be anxious and depressed forever. I've learned that I can make my life what I want it to be and that's really, really cool and I'm really proud of myself because it's taken a lot of introspection, a lot of trial and error to just build this life where I feel happy most of the time and I'm so grateful for it. From Miss Lainey Bin... <laughs> Miss Lainey Benaney, she says, what would you love to achieve with your business in the next five years? Big dreams. So I would love to, first of all, I would really love to hit 100,000 subscribers. To me, that's just like a big dream. Receiving the silver plaque button, I think about it and I like envision it. It feels to me like achieving like a PhD. Like that's how it feels to me. I know it's not the same thing, okay? But the amount of work and love and like blood, sweat and tears that I've put into this YouTube channel, the amount of passion that I have for it, it's like when I get that, I will feel like I've 
earned my PhD. Like it's like a degree to me. So that's like big dream number one. And maybe to some that's like not a big dream, but to me it really is. Um, I really just want to like incorporate my business, keep growing. I want to do more partnerships or more products, like how we did the gentle productivity planner. I would love to grow that into a suite of gentle productivity products, whether that's like merch, pens, like just a bigger suite of products. I love seeing you guys use those planners and I hope that they are making your days a little brighter, making them a little easier, making them satisfying when you check off your to-do list. So more things like that is just a really, really big dream for me. I don't feel this need to like have an empire. I don't, and that's not because I'm like a complacent person or that I don't have big dreams, but I don't know. I don't, I, I don't need to be like, you know, I think a lot of people are like, I want to be like an Elon Musk. I want to be like a Jeff Bezos. I want to be like a the girl boss girl. I'm forgetting her name right now. I hate that my first two examples were men and I so I'm sorry. I'm just thinking of Elon because JS is reading his book right now. But I don't I don't feel the need to be like a billionaire. I want to live a life that where I'm happy and where I'm content. And I would love to have products and services that make people also feel happy and content. And like to me, that's fulfilling like a big enough dream. Like that's that's perfect and that's great for me. Plus like in five years, like we gotta be somewhat realistic in five years. So yeah, more products, 100,000 subscribers, keep just doing what I love, growing a business, that kind of thing. From Miss SeaWorld, what do you like and dislike the most about Montreal? So, okay. What I like the most is summertime in Montreal. It's just such a beautiful and vibrant city. There's so much to do, so many festivals, so much park. So much parks, so many parks. I really, really love Montreal in the summer. I think it's the best city in the world. I think what I dislike the most about Montreal is the winter time. Like I, I don't like the winter. You know, I've tried things to make it better, like skiing, stuff like that. But overall, I'm just really not a winter person. Like this weather is where I thrive. I always say this, but if Montreal could be summer and spring and fall all year round, it'd be the best city in the world. Other things that I like about Montreal are the diversity of people and the diversity of just like restaurants and things to do. There are so many cultures in Montreal and I think that's really, really beautiful because everywhere you look and every neighborhood you go to, there's different types of people, there's different types of restaurants, you're just, I don't know, it's just, I think it's really beautiful to be immersed in different cultures and different ways of living different fashion styles, like from one neighborhood to the other, people are gonna dress differently, they're gonna speak differently, whether they're speaking English or French, like I just think that's really, really cool and I love that. And then, yeah, there's just like a bunch of other stuff I dislike, like the traffic, the potholes, the construction. Quebec politics are really like funny. We won't get into that. But overall, my likes definitely outweigh my dislikes, otherwise I don't think I'd still live there. Okay, we're gonna answer this one next because I think it's kind of funny. From Pipunet2000, hi Zoe, what are your favorite spots in Ottawa? Favorite restaurants, bars, cafes, and things? And so funny to be asking an Ottawa question. I never really get Ottawa questions. And then this round of Q&A on Instagram too, I got some other Ottawa related questions. So for anyone who's new, I grew up in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. It's in a different province, but it's only two hours away by driving from Montreal. Ottawa's known to be a bit more of like a sleepy, boring city. It's a government town. Um, but I've grown to love Ottawa. I moved away because I was like, I hate Ottawa, so boring, get me out of here. Now that I'm older and I myself live like a more slower toned down life where like I'm not really into like the nightlife and stuff anymore, Ottawa is really appealing to me. Okay, let me think. Some of my favorite restaurants. I love Ottawa's Chinatown, but not for the Chinese restaurants, but for the Vietnamese restaurants. My favorite pho restaurant is Pho Boga King on Somerset. It's so good. I really like Pure Kitchen in Ottawa. It's like, a, I think it's veg, it might be vegetarian or vegan. It's like a healthy restaurant. What else, what else? Like where am I always trying to go when I'm in Ottawa? I feel like a lot of my favorite restaurants closed. Like there used to be a smoothie bowl place called Raw Pulp and Grind that closed, but it was really good. Shawarma. <laughs> There's a lot of really good shawarma in Ottawa, but I have to say Montreal's Bustan is better, but now you can get Bustan in Ottawa. So if you live in Ottawa, go to Bustan for like Middle Eastern shawarma, so good. Bars in Ottawa, I couldn't tell you. I feel like I haven't been to a bar in Ottawa since I was like in high school. Don't tell anyone. I, I went like twice, okay? I only went twice. 
and I think they're closed down now. Cafes though, there are really nice cafes in Ottawa. I really like Figaro near train yards. That's a really nice one for like studying, spending time, hanging out. A cafe called Arlington Five. I used to live really, really close to there. That's like the part of Ottawa where I grew up in with my mom. So a little cafe, tiny, tiny cafe called Arlington Five. So good, but like the strongest coffee. Like you wanna talk about getting anxiety from your coffee? Arlington Five, but it's really good, cozy, like local spot. Hi you, come up. Can you guys, no, you can just see her little tail moving. And then in terms of things to do in Ottawa, it makes me laugh so much because during COVID back when I was like on TikTok, I saw this TikTok that really made me laugh and it was like, best things to do in Ottawa, pack up a suitcase and leave. Like, <laughs> so funny, so stupid. While in Ottawa, I mean, I don't know, I guess I'm like a mall rat and I like going to the Rideau Center. There's this place called Conroy Pit, which if you have a dog, it's an off-leash dog park. I love bringing Maggie there and you just walk and walk and walk for like kilometers. It's so good and the dogs just run around and play. I actually love crossing over to the Quebec side and going to Gatineau Park. My favorite part of Gatineau Park is the Mackenzie King estate. I just love it. It's so beautiful. Really, really easy, short hike. Chef's kiss. I'm kind of drawing a blank right now of like things I like to do in Ottawa, most of the time, my trips are always the same. I hang out with family, I go to the Rideau Center. <laughs> That's it. Sometimes we go to the movies. <laughs> All right, let's get into a more deep question. This is from Marie. She says, what are your thoughts on having kids? I hope it's not too personal. I just got curious because I recently saw a documentary on young people not wanting to have kids anymore because of the expenses. So it's really, really interesting. Right off the bat, I can tell you, that I definitely want kids. It's just something that I think I've always known. I've always felt it like in my body and in my intuition that I wanna have a family, I wanna be a mom. I love my family so much, but I definitely had like a rougher time growing up. I went through some things that I don't really think any child should have to go through. We're not gonna get into it in this video, but I think because of that upbringing, I've always wanted to give my kids something different. And now that I'm getting older, I realize that maybe it's like a desire for me to relive a child. I'm going to cry. <laughs> relive a childhood through my own children. And I know that like you can't just guarantee you're going to give your kids like a picture perfect childhood, but I want to try. It's just always, always, always been something that I've known. I think it is really interesting though, this generation, maybe like millenni millennials, I don't, I don't know, like maybe Gen Z are like too young to be kind of thinking about that yet. I guess technically I'm Gen Z-ish because I was born in 96, but some days I identify Gen Z, some days more millennial. But I do know that a lot of people my age and a little bit older are feeling like they don't want kids or they don't know if they want kids. Um, I've actually heard less about the expenses more about things like the environment, just like wanting to keep your life for yourself, which I totally respect. Like I, I genuinely believe it's everyone's own choice to make. I definitely feel like, oh, I wanna wait until I'm more financially prepared to have kids. But then again, I also know that it's not money that kids want. And yes, of course, like money is essential to buy food and to buy diapers and, you know, kids are expensive, life is expensive, but I think more than money, kids want their parents' attention and they want time from their parents and they want quality time with their parents. I feel like that is more important than having money to give, like to give and to spend on your kids. Like I know as a child, I definitely would have preferred to have like more loving, caring attention from my parents than maybe like soccer practice. Like I definitely, I was glad to go to soccer and I was, you know, my parents worked really hard to be able to put me in soccer. But I also would have loved just like their undivided attention some nights or stuff like that. And I think for kids that like love, affection, attention is so much more important than finances. So I think no matter what happens in this life, like I wouldn't let finances stand in the way because I think you can always make it work. Kids don't need a big house. They can share a room, bunk beds, whatever. Sure, we'd all like to give, you know, a beautiful mansion to our children, but it's not essential. So that's never really been my outlook, but I totally understand wanting to wait until you're in a more comfortable place or just not wanting to have it because they're gonna drain your bank account. Like if that's how you feel, that's how you feel and I respect it. But yes, for me, I definitely, definitely want kids. It's obviously something that gets me kind of worked up and emotional because it's a desire that 
I want so badly and so strongly. I've kind of always had a bit of baby fever since I was like in my early 20s. I've always had a little bit of baby fever. It kind of went away when I got Maggie actually because I realized, oh my gosh, a dog is so much work. What would having kids be like? But now that I'm really, really used to life with Maggie and even with her kind of condition that we're working on, I'm like, no, okay, like, I've, I feel like Maggie, as silly as it sounds, like having a dog really did teach me to be selfless. And obviously as a parent, you need to be selfless. Like you need to be, feel like very selfless. So I feel like having a dog kind of turned me off for a little bit and then it like got me back on and it was like, oh, it's a good thing to be selfless. Like it's okay, like I can do it. And yeah, now the baby fever is like coming back a little bit, but I still think I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. <laughs> I have technically I'm good. I'm covered with my IUD until I'm 35. So We'll see. Okay, somebody asked if I had braces. They said I have a beautiful smile, which is really nice Yes, I had braces for a few years when I was pretty young um, Yeah I'm sometimes jealous of the kids these days that just have to have Invisalign. I had like ugly metal braces But I'm grateful for it because I am I do like my smile Another person asked, what type of content do you love the most on YouTube? I definitely love vlogs the most. That's what I watch 90% of the time I watch vlogs. I just find them so comforting and like satisfying. I just, I love vlogs, 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 vlogs. It's so funny because I always try and like make the type of content that I would want to watch. That's like kind of like my driving inspiration behind YouTube is like, okay, what would I wanna see, what would I wanna see? For example, I don't watch techie videos, so I don't really make techie videos. But I love watching just like chill, day in the life, home vlogs. I love watching like more fitnessy vlogs, wellness. So that's kind of what I try and do with my vlogs is like not recreate what I like to watch, but like with my own life, make the type of video that I would wanna watch. But it's funny because those are like my least enjoyed videos on my channel, but like I'll never stop doing them because they're my favorite to watch. I also really like watching just like chatty videos, Q and A's and stuff, like long videos are my favorite. Hence again, why I like making long videos the most. I love a good like 45 minute chatty Q and A or chatty vlog, like my favorite. So speaking of YouTube, Stormy Jackson asked, what is your favorite and least favorite thing about being a content creator? So I also saw this one in advance and right away in my head, it was like, my favorite thing is everything. Like it's really, really so fun. I've been watching YouTube since I was like 12 years old. So I always wanted to do it as well. And then now just being able to do that as like, at this point, my main source of income is like just crazy. I love filming, I love editing, I love just everything. I love interacting with you guys, I love reading the comments, I always try and answer as many comments as I can. I will never leave, <laughs> I like never leave comments on YouTubers who don't reply or heart their comments, so I try my best to be as interactive as possible with you guys, because it's like, well, one, you're taking time out of your day to watch my video. And then two, you're taking even more time to comment. It's like, I have to interact with you guys. I have to say thank you. Like, it's just so important to me. And it also makes me feel really, really connected. Like when I'm filming this video, I don't just feel like I'm talking to a screen or talking to the window behind me. I'm like, oh no, I'm talking to Stormy Jackson. I'm answering her question. And like, there's some people who comment more frequently than others and I feel like I know you guys, like it's so cool. Another highlight is definitely when I receive messages or comments saying, you know, oh, you've inspired me to work on my budget. You've inspired me to save more money. I started cash envelopes and I've saved so much money because of you, I got the budget tracker or just like I care more about my finances because of you, I care more about my mental health, my lifestyle, like, being able to have a positive impact on anyone's life to me like is like oh my god it's like a blessing i want to say like i don't know it's just crazy to be able to it's a gift like to for me to be able to positively in, influence you for me to be able to have a positive impact on your life it's like you're giving me a gift because it makes me feel so satisfied to be able to do that for you because like oh my god why am i getting emotional there were periods in my life where I felt like I had no friends and the only friends I had were the people I watched on YouTube. And sometimes I would feel envious of them, which is why I always try and be like so honest with you guys to like not make anyone feel that way. But 
most of the time I felt inspired by them and just felt like I was kept company in times where I was lonely. So anyways, to be able to do like any of that for anyone else, it's just so cool. And then when you guys are like, oh, I'm almost debt free because like, you know, I've been following along with your videos and you like motivated me, my hair, that kind of thing. It's just so special. There's really only like one part of content creation that I don't like. That's like my least favorite part, which I'm sure you could guess is just having negative comments. Knock on wood, and like I don't want to jinx it, but my comments are typically a very, very, very positive place. It's like not on every video, like seriously, knock on wood. But like it's not on every video. I'm actually gonna do it. It's not on every video that I will get like a hate comment or a trolling comment. And over the years, I've definitely gotten a lot better at dealing with them. I think the hardest thing for me now, like it used to bother me when someone would call me stupid, but like now I know that like I don't need to prove my intelligence to anyone and like if you want to think I'm stupid or you want to think I'm ugly or you want to think I have big teeth or like whatever, you know, that is fine. The thing that's hard is when a comment taps at one of your insecurities, that's really, really hard. Like I will never forget this comment. Someone, I made a video about waking up early and somebody commented that with the bags that I have underneath my eyes, no one should be taking advice from me. And it got a bunch of thumbs up. Like it got like seven thumbs up. And I just, like it hurt me so deeply because I have these circles under my eyes. It's genetic. My grandma has them, my dad has them. Like I think it's a Lebanese thing. I could sleep for three years straight and I would still have these bags under my eyes. So. It was actually not even that she tapped an insecurity of mine because I've never been that insecure. Like it's always just been my face and so it's the way it is. But it's like when someone taps at something about you that like you just can't change, like that I find really, really hurts. Anyways, that person was trolling me for like a really long time. So I blocked her finally. I think that was like my last straw was that comment. But like, I still remember it. That was a year ago and I still remember that comment and it still hurts, you know? So that kind of thing is hard. I've been reflecting about that kind of stuff lately and you know, I think people have always said like, if you put yourself out there, you need to be ready to receive like hate and negativity. And yes, that's a little bit true. It's a lot true, I guess. But I find that message really, really takes away from the person who's leaving those mean comments. She's leaving that comment just to be mean and just to hurt me. And that takes all responsibility away from her and puts it all on me. So me by putting myself out there means that I deserve to have someone tell me that the bags under my eyes that I have no control over make me not credible. I just, I don't understand that. Like why don't we want to encourage people to like be more kind with their words and not spread negativity and hate beyond their keyboard like that i don't understand but anyways that's another topic for another day but overall i mean if the negatives outweighed the positives like i wouldn't be doing this and yeah it just gives you a thick skin and that's life you know like it's not just online that people are going to be mean to you people are mean in real life too okay here's another kind of businessy question from kirsten nelson i'd love to hear more about how you launched your gentle productivity line so Gentle productivity was kind of this thing that I started saying on my channel a few years ago. I remember it was Dina, shout out Dina, who commented like, we need gentle productivity merch. So I really loved that idea. I had been wanting to make merch and it just felt like, yes, I want to do like gentle productivity on a, sweat, on a sweatshirt, on a sweatshirt, it's perfect. I teamed up with a graphic designer here in Montreal called Fine and Dry. His name was Leo, he's so talented. And we made together, well he made, I gave him like some ideas and he made that gentle productivity logo, which I'll put up on the screen, which is now on the planners. I never ended up going through with the merch because I couldn't find a sweatshirt that I liked that was an appropriate price. <laughs> People get mad at YouTubers or podcasters or whoever all the time about like merch pricing and they're like, what do you think this, who do you think I am? You think I'm rich, you're, you're rich, I'm not rich. <laughs> Sorry, I was just reading some comments last night on, on, a, on a, someone who launched merch and people were like outraged by the price, but it is so expensive. When you are a small business trying to get your hands on just sweatshirts, like you're not Walmart, you're not buying thousands and thousands and thousands of skews to be able to drive the price down really really low to like a 15 dollars sweatshirt like and i wanted to make something that was good quality but it would have just cost so much money for the end person 
or else I would have like not made a dollar from it, which kind of then like, you know, like you want to make a little bit of money from, from your merch and from your business endeavor, plus the cost of the graphic designer and everything like that. Like it just would have been so expensive or I didn't like the way it looked. Like it was like, oh, this is good quality. It's a fair price, but I didn't like the look of the sweatshirt and I knew it was not a sweatshirt that like I would wear for years and years and years. So I ended up just sitting on it and waiting. I still think about it, but I still have this predicament of like, what sweatshirt am I gonna use that's affordable, that's good quality, like it's really tough. So I had this logo, but I had nothing to put it on. And then working with the line, when I was working with her on the cash envelopes, like I was just an affiliate. And then, then we had like this really strong affiliate partnership. I kind of had the idea of what about making like a joined product together because she has all the e-commerce experience. She can handle the shipping. She can handle, she has manufacturers. Like she has all the contacts and all the expertise that I don't have. And I have the audience and I have the community and I have the gentle productivity logo that I wanted to use. So it was kind of just like a match made in heaven. Plus like from a business perspective, Raisa and I work together really, really well. I loved working with another woman and I just feel like Raisa is such a, like a powerful woman, she's a businesswoman. I feel like I have learned and I still have more to learn from her. She's really inspiring to me. So it was like a no brainer to wanna collaborate with her. We went back and forth on a bunch of different ideas, a digital product, physical product, and we landed on a planner because I live by my planner. I was using the MYB, the Mind Your Business Planner before the Dental Productivity Planner. And Raisa was like, Zoe, you need your own planner. So. I, on a piece of paper, designed what my dream like daily planner would look like. And then Raisa had the tools to kind of digitize it and make it look really good. She had the supplier connections to like put it into a notebook. We had it printed, we had it bound. We put it in those two colors. It was me who chose the colors. We got like a bunch of kind of swatches and I got to choose the exact color that we wanted. We had them made and shipped over and then we did the photo shoot to kind of promote everything. The line put it all up on their website. The line took care of all of the shipping. It was just like a really, really seamless, to me it was like a made in heaven collab. And they launched and we're now in discussions of bringing them back. From Rutam, they asked, hi, in what way are you training Maggie with her separation anxiety? Are you following any specific training? So I've spoken about how I have really changed my approach to training Maggie. I've changed my mindset, being a lot more positive. It's been going so well, like it's been just a total game changer. And this time I know with absolute confidence it is going to work. That being said, the only thing I changed was my mindset. I'm still following the method that I started with. I learned this method because I had hired a like special separation anxiety trainer. She was so expensive, like so expensive. And I worked with her for a few months and it just like, it was getting better and then it stopped, blah, blah, blah. You basically follow like a spreadsheet and you follow a method of desensitization. So walking up to the door, leaving for a minute, coming back, like leaving for 30 seconds, like leaving all the way up to five minutes and one training session, lasts 30 minutes to an hour because you're going in and out in and out to the door back jiggle the handle come back grab your keys you're basically breaking down your leaving process to build up the dog's tolerance and desensitize the dog to the door and to you leaving to you grabbing your keys all of that stuff if any of you guys which like i hope is not the case but i know it's, i'm not alone in these separation anxiety struggles i really recommend the book be right back by julie naismith you can get it on amazon it is the exact same protocol that my trainer gave me for a 20 dollars book instead of 500 dollars a month training so i'm not using the trainer anymore i'm just doing everything myself i did learn a lot from her so i don't really regret doing it there's no point in having regrets but moving forward like i know what to do now and i'm just going to do it on my own and i hope actually i know that in a few months we're all going to be good to go she's already at 30 minutes in such a short time so i'm really proud and i'm so relieved and i just also this is the other now side of the training is that i've been doing a lot of positive talking and visualization. Like I visualize myself leaving her lying down, being calm and myself going to a spin class, going to the grocery store. Like I visualize all these different things. And yeah, I really think it's working. From Isabel, she asked, what is the best financial advice you could give to students who wanna start making great financial decisions, but don't necessarily have a large income yet? If a student were to start investing during university, what would be the best route, RRSP or TFSA? Love your videos, that's so nice. 
So I feel like I can't really give specific advice on RRSP or TFSA because I'm not like licensed to give that kind of advice. What I would do if I were investing in university, I would do my TFSA. That's what I would do, okay? I would recommend talking to someone at your bank, talking to a financial advisor because they'll be able to give you like proper advice. I think for students or for anyone who doesn't have a large income, whether that's large income yet or just large income period, just do the best, like do what you can. If you, all you have is $200 extra at the end of the month and you have the choice between spending that whole 200, saving that whole 200, splitting it half half, I would lean towards saving or splitting it half half. I think saving all of it, some people are just into that and that's fine. I've never been like a save everything, be super, super frugal. So I would kind of split it up, go out, have fun with your friends. Like, especially when you're in school, I stressed so much over money when I was in school and I look back and regret that I didn't have a little bit more fun. But just building a savings habit, even if it's only $50 a month, having that habit is going to help you so, so much later in life. And then you just get to grow that number. So start small, build a habit and then grow. That would be my advice. And then second part is, yeah, talk to someone at your bank see what they recommend in terms of like your investments. Okay, we are going to answer one last question. I didn't even get to the Instagram questions yet, so we might need to do a part two or I'll just answer over on Instagram. And like, we're at 50 minutes. I've been recording for 50 minutes. This is my most asked question, okay? So we're gonna get into it. From Isa, what is your opinion on living in your partner's home with this investment accumulating, but your paying rent does not accumulate the same for you? Would you want to buy into his home at one point? No hate, just curious about if this feels fair to you, etc. So I appreciate that this was asked kindly. This is another area where I do get like a lot of criticism because I live with my boyfriend. He owns the condo that we live in and then I pay rent. Some people get really upset that like I pay rent. Personally, I don't understand. I understand this question. I'm gonna answer this question, but the first thing I wanna say is I would not feel comfortable living with anyone. We talked about Elon Musk <laughs> earlier in this video. Like I would not live, I give Elon Musk like five bucks a month. Like I wouldn't feel comfortable living rent free anywhere. One, because I just think that it's fair, whether that's with your significant other, with a friend, with your parents, I just think that when you are a person earning an income, it's fair to pay a little bit of rent and you need to find that number that's fair. And we'll talk about that in regards to my situation in a second, but that's just how I feel. The other thing that I feel is not paying any rent unless you're in a situation where you're in school or you're you know, doing something else like raising the family or something else that's contributing to the home. I feel like, I'm like hesitant to say this, but I feel like it can create weird power dynamics. I don't want to live somewhere where like my partner's paying all the bills. I'm also working, but I'm not like also helping pay bills. It just, it feels like a weird power dynamic to me. I would never, it just, it doesn't feel comfortable to me. So for me, I don't like that. If that's what you like, that's fine. Everyone can do whatever they want. I also don't understand not wanting to like, I don't understand this idea that like men should pay everything and then all of my money goes to savings and then what he's not saving any money like i don't i don't understand that in terms of my situation or our situation he bought the condo his investment is accumulating how do i feel about that the first thing i'll say is when we figured out the rent we based the number not on his actual investment accumulating but on the expenses related to the investment so the amount of money that I pay him every single month, one is below the market value. Let's say he were to put the condo onto the rental market for rent. What I'm paying is less than half of that. So already that's pretty good. It's also in relation to him making a little bit more money than me. And the fact that no, I should not be paying for my partner's investment because I have no financial skin in the game there necessarily. What I'm paying towards is the taxes, the condo fees, the internet, the electricity bill, right? I live there, I take hot showers, I run the laundry machine. That all accumulates stuff. I use the pool in the basement. I use things that are covered by the condo fees. So my money is going towards those things. They're not necessarily going to the investment. The other side of that is if I were to live elsewhere, if I were to rent an apartment elsewhere, I'd be paying for someone else's investment. So like, why not give that money to my partner who I see a long-term future with? 
that's really at the end of the day, fair, fair not fair, paying the condo fees, paying the, the investment, paying the mortgage, paying the interest, like all of those things at the end of the day, to me, it's like if I'm living with someone, it's because I see a long-term future with them. And if I see a long-term future with them, then their gains are my gains his condo going up in value also benefits me. That's how I see it. Like at the end of the day, that's how I see it. I could be paying rent to a random landlord like I had before. Because I'm not financially ready to buy my own home or buy my own condo, I've got to rent from someone and I'd rather rent from him. <laughs> if he didn't own this condo and we were looking today to buy, yeah, we would probably be buying together, but I way prefer renting. When he gets tax bills, when he when something breaks in the apartment, I'm like, I don't have to deal with it. And I really like that. I like that I'm finally in a position where I'm saving. I'm saving money. I'm saving for my investments. I'm saving for my future. I like not having kind of like this burden of home ownership. And I do find at the end of the day that the amount of rent that I pay for him for the space that I live in is really, really good and really, really fair. So I'm very, very happy with my situation. I understand some people might not agree with it, but, I, <laughs> but that's not really my problem because I'm happy. And on that topic, somebody else asked if we would like to buy a house together. And the answer is definitely yes, but the real estate market is just so crazy right now. Interest rates are so high, which is another thing with the condo is that it's a small condo, it's a really beautiful condo, but it costs a lot of money in interest right now because he bought it before the interest rates went up. It was a variable interest rate, so really, really expensive on interest right now. But that's also the reason why I don't feel ready to buy anything right now, whether that's alone or with him. We like to look, we look on like Centris, which is the Quebec version of like Zillow. We like to look at houses, we like to think about the future, but the future is not here quite yet. So you guys, I talked so much, I barely got through my coffee i am going to end this video here i had so much fun chatting with you guys catching up answering questions let me know if you want a part two there will definitely be another q a in march we're already in march spring is coming i'm so happy and excited so i want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me in this one i'm going to insert the little cat story time right after this but I will officially say goodbye and that I love you so much and that I will see you in my next video, which is probably going to be a Florida vlog unless you already saw it. Who knows? Okay, bye. <laughs> you guys are not ready for this. Okay, she wants to go. <sighs> when we were filming the laundry clips, one of the cats started meowing out the window. Like I've never heard her meow before. And I'm like, what the heck? We have to keep the screen door that's behind me closed like I'm freaking out right now. We have to keep the screen door that's behind me closed like at all times, just in case the cats get out. They're both half Bengals. So they're very like energetic and they want to explore. There was a point where we left the door open a little crack and I looked at it and I was like, that could have been bad. Then we're filming, one of the cats starts meowing. And I said to Jean, I was like, what if she's meowing because the other cat's outside? Jean was like, no, like the cat didn't get out. I'm filming this before I've started filming the Q&A and right before filming the Q&A, I was like, I'm not gonna be able to get through this filming if I can't find the other cat because the one cat was just staring out the window and I look out the window, I don't see anything. I'm like, what is she looking at? Sometimes they're looking at birds or little lizards. So I'm like, okay, let me go find the other cat, put some peace of mind. I can't find the other cat. I'm like, oh my freaking God, if we lose this cat, like we're dead, <laughs> we're dead. The one cat is still looking outside. so. I go outside to kind of see where she's looking. The other cat is eating the neighbor's grass. I'm so lucky she didn't run away. And when I went to go pick her up, she didn't run away from me either. Like she just knew like <laughs> fun's over. <gasps> we just like narrowly escaped being the worst pet sitters ever. Oh my God. Gene doesn't even know yet because he's over there making a work phone call. The other cat got out. Okay, can you just film me doing making my coffee? It looks okay in the background? Okay. I want cinnamon. Cinnamon butter.